The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is a book of history written by the English historian Edward Gibbon, which traces the trajectory of Western civilization from the height of the Roman Empire to the fall of Byzantium. It was published in six volumes. Volume 1 was published in 1776 and went through six printings. Volumes 2 and 3 were published in 1781, Volumes IV, V, and VI in 1788-89. The original volumes were published in quarto sections, a common publishing practice of the time. The work covers the history of the Roman Empire, Europe, and the Catholic Church from 98 to 1590 and discusses the decline of the Roman Empire in the East and West. Because of its relative objectivity and heavy use of primary sources, unusual at the time, its methodology became a model for later historians. This led to Gibbon being called the first modern historian of ancient Rome. Thesis Gibbon offers an explanation for the fall of the Roman Empire, a task made difficult by a lack of comprehensive written sources, though he was not the only historian to attempt the task. According to Gibbon, the Roman Empire succumbed to barbarian invasions in large part due to the gradual loss of civic virtue among its citizens. They had become weak, outsourcing their duty to defend their empire to barbarian mercenaries, who then became so numerous and ingrained that they were able to take over the empire. Romans, he believed, were unwilling to live a tougher, military lifestyle. In addition, Gibbon argued that Christianity created a belief that a better life existed after death, which fostered an indifference to the present among Roman citizens, thus sapping their desire to sacrifice for a larger purpose. He also believed that Christianity's comparative pacifism tended to hamper the traditional Roman martial spirit. Finally, like other Enlightenment thinkers and British citizens of the age steeped in institutional anti-Catholicism, Gibbon held in contempt the Middle Ages as a priest-ridden, superstitious dark age. It was not until his own era, the Age of Reason, with its emphasis on rational thought, it was believed that human history could resume its progress. Gibbon saw the Praetorian Guard as the primary catalyst of the empire's initial decay and eventual collapse, a seed planted by Augustus when the empire was established. His writings cite repeated examples of the Praetorian Guard abusing their power with calamitous results, including numerous instances of imperial assassination and incessant demands for increased pay. He compared the reigns of Diocletian and Charles V, noting superficial similarities. Both were plagued by continual war and compelled to excessive taxation to fund wars. Both chose to abdicate as emperors at roughly the same age, and both chose to lead a quiet life upon their retirement. However, Gibbon argues that these similarities are only superficial and that the underlying context and character of the two rulers is markedly different. Style Gibbon's style is frequently distinguished by an ironically detached and somewhat dispassionate yet critical tone. He occasionally lapsed into moralization and aphorism. A. S. Long as mankind shall continue to bestow more liberal applause on the destroyers than on their benefactors, the thirst of military glory will ever be the vice of the most exalted characters. The influence of the clergy, in an age of superstition, might be usefully employed to assert the rights of mankind, but so intimate is the connection between the throne and the altar, that the banner of the church has very seldom been seen on the side of the people. History is, indeed, little more than the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortune of mankind. If we contrast the rapid progress of this mischievous discovery of gunpowder with the slow and laborious advances of reason, science, and the arts of peace, a philosopher, according to his temper, will laugh or weep at the folly of mankind. Citations and footnotes Gibbon provides the reader with a glimpse of his thought process with extensive notes along the body of the text, a precursor to the modern use of footnotes. 
Gibbon's footnotes are famous for their idiosyncratic and often humorous style, and have been called Gibbon's table talk. They provide an entertaining moral commentary on both ancient Rome and 18th century Great Britain. This technique enabled Gibbon to compare ancient Rome to modern times. Gibbon's work advocates a rationalist and progressive view of history. Gibbon's citations provide in-depth detail regarding his use of sources for his work, which included documents dating back to ancient Rome. The detail within his asides and his care in noting the importance of each document is a precursor to modern-day historical footnoting methodology. The work is notable for its erratic but exhaustively documented notes and research. John Berry, following him 113 years later with his own History of the Later Roman Empire, commended the depth and accuracy of Gibbon's work. Unusually for 18th century historians, Gibbon was not content with second hand accounts when the primary sources were accessible. I have always endeavored, Gibbon wrote, to draw from the fountainhead that my curiosity, as well as a sense of duty, has always urged me to study the originals, and that, if they have sometimes eluded my search, I have carefully marked the secondary evidence, on whose faith a passage or a fact were reduced to depend. The decline and fall is a literary monument and a massive step forward in historical method. Criticism. Numerous tracts were published criticizing his work and in response, Gibbon defended his work with the 1779 publication of A Vindication of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. His remarks on Christianity aroused particularly vigorous attacks, but in the mid-20th century, at least one author claimed that church historians allow the substantial justness of Gibbon's main positions. Number of Christian martyrs Gibbon challenged church history by estimating far smaller numbers of Christian martyrs than had been traditionally accepted. The church's version of its early history had rarely been questioned before. Gibbon, however, knew church writings were secondary sources, and he shunned them in favor of primary sources. Christianity as a contributor to the fall and to stability. Chapters 15, 16 Volume 1 was originally published in sections, as was common for large works at the time. The first two were well received and widely praised. The last quarto in Volume 1, especially Chapters 15 and 16, was highly controversial, and Gibbon was attacked as a paganist. Voltaire was deemed to have influenced Gibbons claiming that Christianity was a contributor to the fall of the Roman Empire. As Christianity advances, disasters befall the Roman Empire, arts, science, literature, decay, barbarism and all its revolting concomitants are made to seem the consequences of its decisive triumph, and the unwary reader is conducted with matchless dexterity, to the desired conclusion, the abominable manichaeism of Condide, and, in fact, of all the productions of Voltaire's historic school, viz., that instead of being a merciful, ameliorating, and benignant visitation, the religion of Christians would rather seem to be a scourge sent on man by the author of all evil. Gibbon thought that Christianity had hastened the fall, but also ameliorated the results. As the happiness of a future life is the great object of religion, we may hear without surprise or scandal that the introduction, or at least the abuse of Christianity, had some influence on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The clergy successfully preached the doctrines of patience and pusillanimity, the active virtues of society were discouraged, and the last remains of military spirit were buried in the cloister. A large portion of public and private wealth was consecrated to the specious demands of charity and devotion, and the soldiers' pay was lavished on the useless multitudes of both sexes who could only plead the merits of abstinence and chastity. Faith, zeal, curiosity, and more earthly passions of malice and ambition, kindled the flame of theological discord. The church, and even the state, were distracted by religious factions. 
whose conflicts were sometimes bloody and always implacable. The attention of the emperors was diverted from camps to synods. The Roman world was oppressed by a new species of tyranny, and the persecuted sects became the secret enemies of their country. Yet party spirit, however pernicious or absurd, is a principle of union as well as of dissension. The bishops, from 1800 pulpits, inculcated the duty of passive obedience to a lawful and orthodox sovereign. The frequent assemblies and perpetual correspondence maintained the communion of distant churches, and the benevolent temper of the gospel was strengthened, though confirmed by the spiritual alliance of the Catholics. The sacred indolence of the monks was devoutly embraced by a servile and effeminate age, but if superstition had not afforded a decent retreat, the same vices would have tempted the unworthy Romans to desert, from baser motives, the standard of the Republic. Religious precepts so easily obeyed which indulge and sanctify the natural inclinations of their votaries, but the pure and genuine influence of Christianity may be traced in its beneficial though imperfect, effects on the barbarian proselytes of the north. If the decline of the Roman Empire was hastened by the conversion of Constantine, his victorious religion broke the violence of the fall, and mollified the ferocious temper of the conquerors. Tolerant paganism Gibbon has been criticized for his portrayal of paganism as tolerant and Christianity as intolerant. In an article that appeared in 1996 in the journal Past and Present, H.A. Drake challenges an understanding of religious persecution in ancient Rome, which he considers to be the conceptual scheme that was used by historians to deal with the topic for the last 200 years, and whose most eminent representative is Gibbon. Gibbon had written, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosophers as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. Drake counters, with such deft strokes, Gibbon enters into a conspiracy with his readers. Unlike the credulous masses, he and we are cosmopolitans who know the uses of religion as an instrument of social control. So doing, Gibbon skirts a serious problem. For three centuries prior to Constantine, the tolerant pagans who people the decline and fall were the authors of several major persecutions, in which Christians were the victims. Gibbon covered this embarrassing hole in his argument with an elegant demur, rather than deny the obvious. He adroitly masked the question by transforming his Roman magistrates into models of enlightenment rulers, reluctant persecutors, too sophisticated to be themselves religious zealots. Misinterpretation of Byzantium others such as John Julius Norwich, despite their admiration for his furthering of historical methodology. Consider Gibbon's hostile views on the Byzantine Empire flawed and blame in him somewhat for the lack of interest shown in the subject throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. This view might well be admitted by Gibbon himself, but it is not my intention to expatiate with the same minuteness on the whole series of the Byzantine history. However, the Russian historian George Ostrogorsky writes, Gibbon and Lebo were genuine historians, and Gibbon a very great one, and their works, in spite of factual inadequacy, rank high for their presentation of their material, Gibbon's reflections. Gibbon's initial plan was to write a history of the decline and fall of the city of Rome, and only later expanded his scope to the whole Roman Empire. Although he published other books, Gibbon devoted much of his life to this one work. His autobiography Memoirs of My Life in Writings is devoted largely to his reflections on how the book virtually became in his life. He compared the publication of each succeeding volume to a newborn child. Editions Gibbon continued to revise and change his work even after publication. The complexities of the problem addressed in Wimmersley's introduction and appendices to his complete edition. In print complete editions J.B. Berry, ed. 7 volumes, currently reprinted.
until Womersley. This was the essential addition, but now nearing age 100, the historical analysis commentary is dated. ISBN 0-404-02820-9. Hugh Trevor Roper, ed. 6 volumes. The text, including Gibbon's notes, is from Berry but without his notes. The introduction by Trevor Roper is one of his longer considerations of Gibbon and alone makes the edition worth consulting. ISBN 0 679 42308 7, ISBN 0 679 X. David Womersley, ed. Three volumes. Hardback, paperback. The current essential edition, the most faithful to Gibbon's original text. The ancient Greek quotations are not as accurate as in Berry, and Womersley does not seek to evaluate Gibbon's historical claims, as Berry did in his footnotes, but an otherwise excellent work that includes bibliographical help for Gibbon's cryptic footnote notations includes the original index and the vindication, which Gibbon wrote in response to attacks on his caustic portrayal of Christianity. The 2005 print includes minor revisions and a new chronology. ISBN 0-7139-9124-0 ISBN 0-14-043393-7 ISBN 0-14-043394-5 ISBN 0-14-043395-3 In print abridgments David Womersley, ed. 1 volume includes all footnotes and 11 of the original 71 chapters. ISBN 0-14-043764-9-848-0 Hans Friedrich Müller, ed. 1 volume abridgment, includes excerpts from all 71 chapters. It eliminates footnotes, geographic surveys, details of battle formations, long narratives of military campaigns, ethnographies and genealogies, but retains the narrative from start to finish. Based on the Rev. H. H. Dean, Millman edition of 1845, ISBN 0-375-758-119, ISBN 0-345-478-84-3, Legacy. Many writers have used variations on the series title, especially when dealing with large nations or empires. Piers Brendan notes that Gibbon's work became the essential guide for Britons anxious to plot their own imperial trajectory. They found the key to understanding the British Empire in the ruins of Rome, an inquiry into the permanent causes of the decline and fall of powerful and wealthy nations, designed to show how the prosperity of the British Empire may be prolonged. William Playfair the rise and fall of the Confederate government, Jefferson Davis, the decline and fall of practically everybody, by the satirist Will Cuppy, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, William Shira, the rising sun, the decline and fall of the Japanese Empire, John Toland, the decline and fall of science, Celia Green, the Ottoman centuries, the rise and fall of the Turkish Empire, Lord Canross, the Decline and Fall of the Roman Church, Malachi Martin. Decline and Fall of the Freudian Empire, Hans Eysenck. The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, Paul Kennedy. The Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy, David Canadine. The Rise and Fall of the British Empire, Lawrence James. The Decline and Fall of Roman Britain, Neil Faulkner. Empire. The Rise and Demise of the British World Order and the Lessons for Global Power, Niall Ferguson. The Decline and Fall of the Catholic Church in America, David Carlin. The Decline and Fall of the British Empire, Piers Brendan. Three Victories and a Defeat. The Rise and Fall of the First British Empire, Brendan Sims. Decline and Fall of the Sasanian Empire, Parvan Air Decline and Fall of the American Republic, Bruce Ackerman. The Rise and Fall of the British Empire, Mercantilism, Diplomacy in the Colonies, Philip J. Smith. And in music albums, Arthur, The Kinks. The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, David Bowie. And in film titles, 
the fall of the Roman Empire, the declining of Western civilization, Penelope Spherish, the declining of the American Empire, Denis Arcand, and in television, Ancient Rome, the rise and fall of an empire. The title and author are also cited in Noel Coward's comedic poem, I Went to a Marvelous Party, and in the poem, The Foundation of Science Fiction Success. Isaac Asimov acknowledged that his Foundation series, an epic tale of the fall and rebuilding of a galactic empire, was written, with a tiny bit of, cribbin, from the works of Edward Gibbon. In 1995, an established journal of classical scholarship, Classics Island, published punk musicians Iggy Pop's reflections on the applicability of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to the modern world in a short, article, Caesar Lives, in which he noted, America is Rome. Of course, why shouldn't it be? We are all Roman children, for better or worse. I learn much about the way our society really works, because the system origins, military, religious, political, colonial, agricultural, financial, are all there to be scrutinized in their infancy.